So I finally got a Sorry. chance to go to Governor Bryan's new state, uh, third state of the territory address. Um, mm -hmm. I had to skim through it because it's pretty lengthy. But before we get started with that, uh, walk me and our, our viewers through uh, what your past five, four or five days has been on Capitol Hill. <laughs> um, well, today was, you know, a very uh, ceremonial day where the impeachment managers walked over um, to the House, the articles of impeach, the article of impeachment of the president. So that begins the motion practice and eventually the trial of the president, um, Donald J. Trump, uh, for inciting insurrection, high crimes and misdemeanor and treason uh, against the Constitution and the people of the United States. Um, but in between that, been doing regular work as well. Uh, my staff is, you know, we're continuing to have meetings talking about constituent cases that we're working on. Um, even trying to, you know, have a dynamic com communications team that's creating a portal for people to, rather than come into the office, be able to do it via Zoom or others to really deal with their cases that way. Um, talking about funding issues. I am also now gonna be on the Ways and Means Committee. So meeting with the Joint Committee on Taxation uh, about how you know drafting legislation that's relevant to the people, not just of the Virgin Islands, but the territories as well. So doing all of that while at the same time, you know, putting in an additional eight hours, you know, a day preparing for a trial. So um, a little busy. I'd imagine. A little tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what happened today in the Virgin Islands is also really important, where our governor gives not just the legislature, um, other elected officials like myself, judges, others, um, his assessment of what the state of the territory is, but the people of the Virgin Islands get to hear as well what the governor believes to be the state of our territory. Right. Um, question for you as far as that. I tried to do some research a couple a couple weeks ago or a couple days ago, and I wasn't able to find it. Are you are you are you do you know if you are the first impeachment manager to be appointed from a U.S. territory? Yes. You are. Yes. Okay, historic. <laughs> <laughs> um, Val Demings would have been the first uh, black woman, um, and I'm the second. Okay, congratulations. There's, thank you. I mean, there's only been four president, well, three presidents, <laughs> one now twice, so four impeachments of a president. Although there have been a number of impeachments of other elected officials, senators, judges, um, et cetera, cabinet members, um, but only for impeachments of the president. Right. Maybe you can answer this question uh, for uh, viewers as well. Governor Bryan, a couple of weeks ago as well, when the Senate flipped to blue, uh, began speaking about possible new aid coming to the uh, to Virgin Islands and other territories. I know that uh, President Biden has put out his package and he's also working on a bipartisan agreement with uh, I guess, uh, people that are currently elected to Congress. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of anything that might be specific for the Virgin Islands or any of the territories? It's been a, it's been a lot of information to read. So I'm wondering if you could um, help us understand what we would be getting and what uh, we might be uh, expecting. Sure. Well, um, President Biden um, has put forward a $1.7 trillion package for additional stimulus money um, to support Americans as we try to recover from COVID. That includes another round of stimulus checks, uh, support for small businesses, et cetera. But he's also looking at um, support to the territories, to municipalities, to the states, to offset loss revenues that they might have had. Um, for the Virgin Islands, we also in Congress, the House passed a bill, um, which is part of the negotiation that he's doing. And his is kind of a framework for what he'd like, but in the House bill that we pass, that is specifically states how much areas are supposed to get, 
um, the Virgin Islands would have, would receive about one billion dollars um, in revenue support for lost revenues, which is greater than our budget each year. You know, we have a, a budget of about a billion dollars, so um, that would be a tremendous amount. But of course, it's the negotiation. You know, that's the difficult mm -hmm. part. Um, and it isn't just now that you know. Now that we have a democratically controlled Senate. Um, there are still negotiations that need to be done, gives and take, give and take. Not all uh, Democrats in the Senate believe that a package should be this large. Um, and so we'll see what happens with those negotiations. Amazai, at the same time, um, members of Congress recognize that we can't just keep printing money. And so we have to come up with new ways to jumpstart the economy in the same way that we did like after the Great Recession, after the Great Depression, where we created a package that allowed America to continue to create jobs, infrastructure, to jumpstart the economy. Um, you know, the Great Recession, when we had that in the early 2000s, President Obama instituted the Americans Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, otherwise known as ARA, um, and that was so successful that the next president, Trump, was still able to claim a lot of credit for some of the residual economic growth from that um, first package. So the committee that I'm now sitting on Ways and Means will be the primary committee that creates this package of what a recovery bill would look like, um, how much infrastructure, how much tax credits are going to be in there, um, how are we going to support areas that are left behind? One of the things that I think has really been very evident in COVID is that all of the issues that have been across America, um, all of the ills, all of our fallacies have really been peeled away. And we've been able to see what was in fact um, the problems that were already existing in this country, right? So children who now could not no longer be in the classroom, we saw now in stark contrast, kids whose families were able to create pods, you know, there are places in New York City, here in Washington, DC, where parents have sufficient money that they have six kids in a pod and they've hired a tutor that sits and works with them throughout the day. They all have their own Chromebooks where they're working and they're operating fine. And then there's another student, uh, whether it's in DC or in St. Croix, in you know, Dunu or somewhere else, that their parents aren't have to go to work and they're left at home by themselves. Or they don't have, um, you know, they may have a Chromebook, but they don't have the connectivity to be able to um, connect with their teacher or get the additional support that they need. Families that were living paycheck to paycheck are now also, uh, you know, either on the razor's edge or have gone over and they're on food lines trying to get additional assistance for food. Um, all of the problems that were already existing in our country, I think this pandemic has just kind of really shown what's really happening with us. Just even in healthcare, the amount of the disproportionate amount of people of color who have gotten COVID because of the type of work that they do, the environments they live in, in comparison to, um, you know, non-people of color. Right. <clears throat> so you've, yeah. you're just about to start your, you started your fourth term uh, in office, correct? I know, I can't believe it. Listen, I'm not a millennial, but I don't stay in jobs this long, usually. <laughs> this is really unusual for me. But I will say this, that one of the great things about being a member of Congress is that you can continually grow, you know, that there are new challenges as the country, as your constituents face new challenges. Um, and so that, that, and there are things that I want to accomplish and it takes time to accomplish those things. And uh, I want to stay here to finish those things. So yes, I'm in my fourth term now. I'm no longer a newbie on the Hill. Gotcha. So I have, I have two questions that are kind of related, but I'll start with the first one uh, before that. You've worked under two governors so far under disasters or under uh, dire circumstances like this, under Governor Mapp and of course now under Governor Bryan. 
I remember in the last administration, you mentioned that you had an issue with uh, the MAP administration uh, not coordinating uh, in the in the weeks, I guess, and months after Hurricanes Irma and Maria. Are you able to tell us any differences working with this administration, um, go, working through COVID-19? Sure. Um, well, you know, I think the Department of Health has been very, very open with our staff about what their issues are, their challenges, how we can be supportive of them. That's been a really tremendous uh, partnership, I believe. You know, we want to support them in any way we can. And it's no secret that um, Governor Bryant and I, you know, have a great deal of respect for each other, like each other. Uh, our children went to school with each other. Um, and so there's a fami familiarity there to be able to pick up the phone or to text each other when there are issues. Um, of course, there's always tensions between uh, the administration and the, um, you know, the delegate's office. Um, I'm very careful to not go into someone else's lane. Um, and I'm careful, I'm very, you know, proud of the work that I do and want credit for what I do, you know, the money that I bring into the territory and want to be supportive of the administration in every way I can um, so that they can fulfill the promises that, you know, the Bryan administration has to the people of the territory. And that it's, Amaziah, when you work really hard, you know, I have a team that because of our population, our staff is smaller than other people's staff. And our needs are greater than a lot of other districts needs. And so myself and our team work really hard to ensure that our voice is heard and that we get the money that we need for these projects that are coming online. And the most, um, can be the most frustrating and debilitating feeling is feeling handcuffed because that money comes down to the local government. And it's for the local government to disseminate and to make sure that it gets out to the people. And so, you know, I'm always very bullish and anxious to support the administration to make sure that's happened. But I recognize that that's their uh, lane as well. So, you know, when needed, we speak and we work with each other, but we're also, I think, respectful of each other's lanes and responsibility. Understandable. And so maybe you can bring a little bit of clarity uh, when it comes to uh, specifically hurricane aid. I know it's been, uh, that's 2017 and we're now in 2021. It feels like a, a long time ago. Um, I think that Virgin Islanders sometimes have a hard time understanding uh, where the money is going or what it's actually being used for. So my question to you is, could you explain how the bill for our hurricane aid was packaged and are we getting it all in like one big chunk or are we, do we have to complete it in phases and actually show uh, receipts or reimburse the federal government in any way? Right. Um, well, thankfully we are not, in, in most places, the local government would spend the money and then wait to be reimbursed by the federal government for those projects that they believe the federal government has approved. Um, because the Virgin Islands, we have entered into a hurricane with a deficit of funding. We don't have the money to put up front. Uh, and so we have got to get approval on the front end for those projects to work on those projects and make sure that that money um, you know, is, is then being spent in the manner that it is. So, um, you know, the governor has said in this past fiscal year, he's, the local government has expended, has spent approximately $339 million in federal disaster recovery, um, and that they're expected to expend about $621 million in the current fiscal year. Uh, that's almost 75% of their operating budget is coming out of this disaster funding. You know, a lot of it we saw on the front end with the cleanup, um, and now we're beginning to see the fruition of actual rebuilding. That has taken longer, and I would also, you know, let people know that a lot of that is not just our local government having issues with capacity, having the ability and the, and the people to be able to make that happen, but we were in a, a federal administration 
that didn't want to release the funding that Congress appropriated to them. So I'm working and my staff is working so that we have about $7 billion available for us to spend. And we've expended, you know, several billion on just the disaster cleanup and, you know, just fixing and getting things in a workable order. And now we have large pockets of money for rebuilding. We had uh, an administration up until January 20th that had said, and, you know, in closed doors to me that they didn't believe that we should have that much money, that, um, it should not be, things should not be rebuilt in the Virgin Islands they, to as it should be rather than as it was, right? Congress exponentially uh, increased the amount of funding that the Virgin Islands received so that we wouldn't just have to rebuild as things were at the time of the hurricane, but they recognized finally that the part of the reason that we had the level of destruction we did was because we did not have uh, federal funding beforehand to have the resilience in place. And so Congress gave us even larger amount, larger amount of money, um, and we were faced with a, a, an administration that believed that that was the state's responsibility. That's local government responsibility, not federal. And so I'm hopeful, not just because we have um, a Democratic Senate, but because we have an administration where we have deep relationships to be able to finally release that money. Um, Marsha Fudge, who's going to be this, you know, on Thursday, will have her confirmation hearing in the Senate, um, is my mentor. You know, that is the person who I checked in with, have checked in with for the past um, six years as I, you know, make my way in Congress. Um, you know, Cedric Richmond, who is uh, uh, in is going to be the senior account, senior policy advisor to the president is a really close friend of mine and represented New Orleans. And so he understands the issues of rebuilding after a hurricane. Um, those are the kinds of relationships we have now. Javier Becerra at Health and Human Services uh, was a former colleague of mine. Deb Holland, who's going to be the uh, head of the Department of Interior not only was a former colleague, but my husband just came back in November from organizing and working on her reelection campaign. So these are people that are going to be in positions of saying yes or no to us, to expediting things that are a text message, you know, a phone call away. Congresswoman, I have two more questions for you and then I'll, I'll let you go. I know you have a busy night. Uh, first question is, mm -hmm. uh, are you able to uh, explain what some of these executive orders that President Biden has signed so far? For instance, the executive orders about, uh, I'm aware of when stimulus checks will be coming out for the for Virgin Islanders. It should be sometime in February. Uh, mm -hmm. But SNAP benefits and all the other extra things that he's actually uh, packed into these executive orders that might be a little bit confusing right now. Well, um, you know, a breakdown of the executive <laughs> orders would be a little difficult for me now. But I think that what you can see is that they fall within, um, you know, several frameworks. Um, some of these executive orders uh, are related to immigration, right? So he reversed the administration's restriction on U.S. entry for passport holders from Muslim nations. Um, he fortified the DACA. Um, after Trump's efforts to undo protections for undocumented people brought into the country as children. You know, people forget that there are a lot of DACA children in the Virgin Islands. We have, you know, over 500 of them that are in the Virgin Islands. And so they need protection as well. Um, he did a lot of work in the environment. Um, extending existing nationwide moratoriums on um, extending the existing, uh, I'm thinking on rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, canceling right. Keystone um, XL pipeline and directing agencies to review um, more than 100 Trump actions in the environment. And then in the economy, he extended the existing national moratorium on evictions and foreclosures until at least March 
31st and extended the existing pause on student loan payments and interest for Americans with federal student loans till at least September 30th. So, you know, a lot of things launched a 100 days masking challenge, asking Americans to wear masks for 100 days, requiring mask and physical distancing in federal buildings, um, creating a position on COVID-19 response coordinator, uh, reporting directly to Biden. A lot of executive orders have been put forward. Issues of equity, right? Rescinding Trump administration's this what he called his 1776 Commission on Racial Equity, um, preventing workplace discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Those are all the things um, that the president has done, you know, first day on the job getting to work, you know, the rescinding the ban on transgenders uh, in the military, just tremendous amount of work. I mean, I thought it was just amazing to see the inauguration, which Amaziah was freezing cold. <laughs> and then, um, you know, the march in the ceremony. And then um, he goes to the White House. The president goes to the White House and begins reading and actually reading before signing executive orders. And Kamala Harris, our new vice president, Harris, leaving the old executive office building, going to the Senate floor and swearing in, you know, three senators, her replacement from California, a Latino male, um, and then, you know, a black man from Georgia and uh, a Jewish man from Georgia. Just tremendous show of not just work ethic, but the diversity and, you know, normalcy of our country. So the last interview we had was, I think, uh, last summer. And you mentioned that close to the end that I thought I was uh, going easy. So I have a tougher question for you. Uh -oh. Did I say research. that back then? You did. <laughs> so I did some, I heard from a friend, but I also did some research on my own. But I learned that you uh, originally were registered as a Republican and then you uh -huh. transferred over to the Democratic Party. Um, mm -hmm. I know right now it's probably hard working with, with your Republican colleagues. But um, could you explain or say why, you know, you, you might have changed parties at the time? Well, I was interestingly first a Democrat um, when I registered at the age of 18. Um, then when at one point when I worked on the House, I had to be nonpartisan, not bipartisan, nonpartisan as a member of the House Ethics Committee. And I went to the Republican Party when I was offered a position with the Bush administration, um, working at the Justice Department after September 11th. Um, you know, I still continue to have tremendous, really close relationships with my former bosses. One, Rob Portman, who is the Senator from Ohio, who's actually announced today that he would not be seeking reelection and was gonna retire in 2022. And then um, Deputy Attorney General Larry Thompson and uh, James Comey, who was also the deputy attorney general that I worked for. Just tremendous principled men uh, who cared about this country, had a conservative bent on, uh, you know, how finances should be utilized um, in the country, but uh, by all means is nowhere near what we see in some sectors of the Republican Party now. And when I came back home to the Virgin Islands, you know, I became, went back to being a Democrat. Um, but listen, I consider myself a moderate Democrat, which means that I um, am a pragmatic uh, Democrat who is concerned with uh, finances and uplifting business and economic development and supporting that in every way I can. And when I can work with Republicans, I do. Uh, I have bills that I've authored with, you know, Don Young, who's the Dean of the House, the longest serving member from Alaska, you know, a grizzled, uh, you know, old Republican, or my next door neighbor here on the Hill, um, Garrett Graves, a Republican from Louisiana, who understands how the, the need to have federal government expedite and get rid of bureaucracy when you need to rebuild as he represents you know, areas of Shreveport and Baton Rouge. 
So when I can, uh, it's the preference because I believe, and I think our history has shown as a country that the most lasting legislation that we have, the ones that stay over time, are when there is a give and take between both parties, a real negotiation, and you can get others from the other side to come with you um, so that there's buy-in from both sides. And I think that really supports uh, what's the best of us, you know, when it comes to Social Security or the original Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, um, you know, the New Deal with um, Social Security and others. Those were all super majorities who voted for those things. And they're around 50 years later. So maybe we can finish on legislation based on uh, what we were just talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. November that just passed, the Virgin Islands, uh, Virgin Islands voters uh, were able to vote on a referendum for our fifth constitutional convention. Uh, I, to my knowledge, it does have to go through an approval process. The Congress- I don't think they, they didn't ask for a fifth constitutional convention. I believe the referendum was that we adopt the Organic Act, right? As Correct. a constitution. Uh -huh. So I, I think, the way how the senators had it at the time would be adopting correct the revised organic act as our constitution but i'd imagine yeah. that it would still have to have a convention for that to happen for them to ratify it right mm -hmm. uh, my question for you was uh now that the house has well the house is still uh, democratic controlled the senate has flipped and so has the white house um over the next two years do you think that there will be any movement on a constitutional convention or at least uh, adopting the revised organic well act? Um, in this last Congress, so um, the first two five bills in Congress, um, HR1, HR2, HR3, those bills are reserved for the Speaker of the House. And the Speaker determines what is the content of those bills because those bills then become the quintessential um, messaging and, um, you know, what the speaker is laser focused on. So for example, Paul Ryan's HR1 was the tax cuts um, bill that was passed in 2015. For Speaker Pelosi, her HR1 in this last Congress was um, a For the People Act, a bill that was related to voting rights, election reform, campaign finance. And a section of that bill was the creation of a commission on voting rights in the territories, on developing um, to have a study that looked at what was the effect of disenfranchisement in the territories, economically, um, socially, uh, what has been the impact of not being able to vote, and to come up with recommendations on how to be able to bring franchisement, meaning the vote for president, as well as to have voting full voting representation in the House and the Senate. And it's our understanding that HR1 will be reintroduced in this Congress that has that section in there as well, which is, I think, you know, Congress's way of saying, yes, we recognize that you need to be moving towards this, uh, you know, maturity and not to remain in this perpetual limbo of territorial status, i.e. colonial, um, status as well. I mean, one of the things that I have done in now two successive legis local legislatures is sending a letter to the Senate president and requesting that they uh, appropriate a small amount of funds to educate, truly educate the electorate on what is the benefits of the different forms of, um, you know, positions that we could take, whether it's move to statehood or to become a commonwealth um, for independence, or what do we want? And what are the pros and cons? Not just um, not legally or politically, but economically, right? What would be the outcome of each? And to present that to the people of the territory so that on our, you know, we now have two years coming up, our 175th year from emancipation, we have a vote on that. What do we want to be? Um, and that vote would then be a mandate for the member of Congress from the Virgin Islands 
to take that, um, that baton up, that will of the people up in Congress. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, for talking with me. And also thanks for bringing uh, clarity to some of these issues. Thank you. Thanks so much. And you take care of yourself and please be safe. And people, please wear a mask, wash <laughs> your hands, social distance. Some of us have received vaccines, but we've got to tamp down the spread. So that's not going to, we're not going to get back to normal until people do that. For sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. You too. Good night. Good night.